The armor that God has given us is not only for defending against the enemy, but for attacking the enemy for good reason. We are to face the enemy. We are not to gaze at him from a position of safety as Saul and his array of generals, ministers, and priests did. Instead, we are to march into Elah and engage the enemy as David did. We are commissioned by God to engage the enemy in his territory with the sword of truth. We are to bring and proclaim this truth to all. We are at war and we are called to enter it. We must understand the need to prepare for battle. David did indeed march into Elah with faith. He also marched in with the weapon he prepared with. So too, God wishes us to be prepared for a war that is intensifying, where there is chaos and confusion everywhere. God's word in Ephesians describes the war we are in and how to prepare for it. There's so much more than putting on the armor of God. Join us as we study Ephesians with hearts of servant warriors in service to a victorious king. Real quick before we get started, um, we're going to be covering this tonight. So it's the three verses or the connecting verses. All right. It's a lot to write down. I know. Um, but we're going to talk about wisdom and revelation. But before we get started, before I pray, this gentleman here, his name is Gus Matero. This is when he was a gunnery sergeant in the Marine Corps. He was the first Marine to come into the anchor back in 1951. In fact, it hadn't even opened yet. And uh, he came in. You guys remember when I was passing the birthday card around? He was turning 98. So that's the gentleman. And uh, that's him now. So there's John and Mark and Gus. So Gus is a World War II vet and a Korean vet. All right. He turned 98. Keep him in prayer because uh, he's, he's declining. Right. He, he no longer looks like that man there. And well, none of us do. If you look at my boot camp picture versus now, I look like I ate the person in the boot camp picture. <laughs> All right. So now... Um, the other thing is keep in prayer. And the cool thing about Gus is that he came into the anchor two days after giving his life to Christ. Uh, he wanted to serve the Lord and then he went to be a missionary for 50 years in Russia. So this is during communist Russia. So he was going in and out of Russia, taking Bibles and strapped to him. And he has amazing stories. And, um, he said that. The, the, the group that was the fastest to reach were the children, the children and the preteens, because they were hungry for the gospel. And so they used the riverways to get the gospel out by going by boat. So he, he came back from the mission field, and then he went back again to Russia, and then they sent him back at, I think, 90, because he fell off a wall. All right? He's a tough guy. He's still a tough dude at 98, all right? So, but uh, that's Gus that you um, been praying for, and that he um, we signed the birthday card for. All right. Okay. If you have your Bibles, open up to Ephesians chapter one. We're going to finish Ephesians one today, Lord willing. Let me pray. Lord Jesus, thank you for today. Thank you for all that you've been doing and providing. I pray that you would speak to us through your word. I pray that you would help me convey the message you have for everyone. And Lord, I just pray that you would um, move upon us and that we would apply it to our life, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay. So we've been going through Ephesians. Uh, there's a lot of components here that relate to military walk, which is the whole purpose of this about spiritual warfare. As we get stronger into Ephesians six, we're going to see more of that, but different aspects. And like tonight, I said we're going to talk about um, wisdom and 
Revelation. So let me start out by reading uh, 15 through 23. Therefore, I also, after I heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for all the saints, do not cease to give thanks for you, making mention of you in my prayers, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give to you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him. Verse 18, the eyes of your understanding being enlightened that you may know what is the hope of his calling. What are the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints? And that, and in what is the exceeding greatness of his power towards us who believe according to the working of his mighty power? which he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand and in the heavenly places. Far above principalities, powers, and might and dominion, and every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in which is to come. Did the mic die? Okay, it sounded like mine, it died. And he put all things under his feet and gave him to be head over the things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. So let's take a moment to break this down. All right, the first thing, Paul's prayer is for the church in Ephesus. All right. Ephesus had lots of problems with demonic things. They even called a lot of the demons and stuff, the beasts of Ephesus. All right. Because Ephesus was known for demonic powers, just like Corinth would be equivalent to today as Las Vegas on steroids. Ephesus was its focal point of the most satanic, evil, demonic practices around. It was really, really bad. So he's praying for the church that is found in the heart of, of some of the most wicked, evil things and satanic practices that are happening. And so that they would survive and that they would strive. And that's why he's going to talk later about this whole battle. And remember, as we're looking at these components, I'm going to later show you how they all apply into you as if you were putting on armor or as if you were getting ready for a battlefield. So Paul's prayer for the church in Ephesus for this. The second part is the spirit of wisdom. All right. So he tells them, spirit of wisdom, spirit of revelation. So again, therefore, also after I heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and in the love of all the saints, right? Do not cease to give thanks uh, for you making mention of you in my prayers. Well, this is difficult at times. Prayer is important. We need to pray. It's 100% important that we pray that's why i opened it up for everyone to pray me and my team we get together and pray but there's something about prayer that the enemy likes to block sometimes it turns into social fest we're there to pray and it's just how was your week it was great and what did you get into no i went and saw the sports game my golf swing blah 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 and we forget to pray right prayer is so important and we get in and And as we pray as a group, some of us, we have this gift of what's called intercessory prayer. We're really good at it. We we can pray for hours and it feels like five minutes. And then there are some of us who we prayed for 10 and we're like, well, that was great. We've been here for three hours. And you're like, oh, it's been 10 minutes. So (laughs) it's a struggle. So let's just be honest for a minute. Who finds it hard to pray? Okay. Who finds it super easy to pray? Who here who finds it super hard to pray partners up with somebody who finds it easy? I hope, all right? Because the thing is, the enemy bombards your mind. You go to pray, and all of a sudden, it's every little thing playing out through your week. Then it's like, I got to do this, and I got to do that, and I got to get the oil change. I got to take the car to this. Oh, and the dog that, blah, 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 blah. And then the enemy throws everything in your face to remind you of your past and just scenario after scenario. And it's the most obnoxious thing if you ever dealt with it. But prayer is important. 
Last week, we had Mike McIntosh who talked about targeted prayer. Who's read the book already? Anyone go through the book? Okay. It's really good, isn't it? I've been applying it since I learned it from when I was at the pastor's conference with them. And so it's very helpful in the application of it. Everyone's got a style. Some people write in books. Some people, they pray out loud, pray quietly, pray as a family, walk and pray. I have a hard time walking and praying. I don't know how you guys do that. I can't seem to walk in prayer. I have to hold still, all right? So, so we just, it's so important that we find ourselves that we're praying, all right? And he's telling them the importance of praying. Notice what he says here again, verse 15, for the love of all the saints. Who's that? That's us, right? So you are, if you're in Christ, you are a saint. It is not statues. You do not need to pray to saints. It is you. It is us, Hagios, who have been bought with the blood by Jesus Christ. All right? So, don't cease to pray. Continue to pray. Notice verse 17. That the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give to you the spirit of wisdom and revelation and the knowledge of him. Spirit of wisdom and spirit of revelation. Okay? So in wis- the, the, the wisdom part, let's talk about this for a minute. Wisdom. In Greek, it's Sophia. So if you ever met someone named Sophia, it means wisdom. So if you have a granddaughter or a daughter or a niece named Sophia and they're acting foolish, they're not living up to their name. All right? <laughs> wisdom. Sophia. All right? For, and it means wisdom. It also means to use knowledge. The use of knowledge, to understand how to use knowledge. A lot of people gain knowledge. They like to collect knowledge. They like to get all this knowledge, but they don't know how to put it into application. All right? How does that saying go? Uh, master of all trade or jack of all trades, master of none. They have a lot of knowledge, but they don't put it into use. It's the use of the knowledge is wisdom, what to do with it. When you get the knowledge, what do I do with it? How do I apply it? Where do I put it into application? And that's what's important, right? All right, so in other words, it's what is given to you, how do you use it? So in Hebrew, oh, we're going to go this way, right here. In Hebrew, it is the word chokham, all right, which is this word right here. Chet, kaf, mem, che, chokham. It means wisdom, all right? And when you look at it, again, you're looking at it in the sense of there's, there's different ways to look at it because of the seven layers when it comes to Hebrew, but you're looking at a picture in the gospel message of a yoke of the Messiah, the hand that's open, humility, and the spirit living in you. When you humble yourself before the Lord, you gain what? Wisdom. Because as the Bible tells us that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. And there's earthly wisdom or worldly wisdom, and there's godly wisdom, okay? Has anybody ever read Pilgrim's Progress or seen the movie? Or it's worldly wise. Worldly wise, he has all the answers of how things work in the world, but he doesn't understand anything about God. And worldly wise tells uh, Pilgrim that he's trying to get to the celestial temple or the heavens, which is the story of our Christian walk. And he goes, no, there's an easier way to go. You don't have to take the path that the evangelist said to go through the narrow gate. You can go right up this mountain and it will take you right up there. But as he goes up the mountain, he discovers it's nothing but legalism. And more and more and more legalism until the weight is too much to bear because that's worldly wise. See, that's the thing about following Jesus. It's about him changing our hearts and transforming us. It's not about us doing works and looking a certain religious way. Religion will always leave you dry. What? Yeah, I'm not religious. Wait, what? Jesus wasn't religious. This is controversial. No, actually, it's not. Think about it. Religion is I do all these works to reach God just to do what? Fall short because you mess up. Anyone perfect in this room? If you are, I will let you come up here and you teach us what, we're, what we did wrong. All right? We all fall, fall short. This is what Romans tells us. We all, we all fall short of the glory of God, right? There's a relationship with Jesus Christ 
is a complete different thing than religion. Because you have a relationship with the living God who meets you where you're at to pull you out of the mire, to transform your heart and your mind, to be like him. That is different than religion. And a lot of people practice religion hoping to do a lot of good and does absolutely nothing. Absolutely nothing. You have to have a relationship with Jesus Christ. It's the only way. It's the only way. And he gives us the wisdom to look at things and to understand. So when you look at the chaos of this world, you look at the madness of this world, you make wise decisions in what you're getting involved with. So I highly recommend pray before you buy a house. Pray before you get married. Pray before you date. Pray before you get things. That's what the importance of the prayer part is. So you use good wisdom into making decisions. But some people take this to the extreme and they're like, well, Lord, do I eat a burger or a hot dog? I don't know. Whatever you're in the mood for, eat it. It's not a big deal. But you need to seek the Lord and wisdom where you're going to go for your future. It's so important. So many people make decisions based on emotions or what makes them feel good in the moment. And when the emotional high is gone, then what? There lies the problem. And sometimes when you ask people, well, how do you know they're saved? And they're like, oh, I just feel amazing. I just feel, woo, the birds. And oh, it's so. And when you don't feel like that, are you not saved? When it's a bad day, when it's super rough, when you're sick? You see, that's salvation is what Jesus did on the cross to set us free. It's not based on emotions. It's not based on emotions at all. The importance is that you use the wisdom that God gives you to understand where you're going and how to do it. And it's the same with the word of God. And unfortunately, there's so many churches, there's so many places, especially in this day and age where they want to do social gospel and social justice and all this stuff. They want to twist this and mix it up to what they want it to be. This is not a buffet, ladies and gentlemen. You don't get to pick what you want and what you don't. You either take the whole counsel of God or you don't. You can't go, well, I like this part of Matthew and not that part. I like the part where I feel good and I get to go eat a Big Mac 30 minutes later. Not the part that I have to look at myself in the mirror and go, so where am I really going? That's the reality of it. Okay. So wisdom. The spirit of revelation. In Greek, it's called apocalypsis. Some of you who speak Spanish know what that is. What is it? Opaca's lips. No. Uh, all right. It's a Lamageddon and Opaca lips. All right. Now. Apocalypsis is the Spanish for revelation. Apocalypsis, the book of revelation. Apocalypsis. Apocalypsis in the Greeks means unveiling. That's what Revelation means, the book of Revelation, unveiling, unveiling of what's going to happen in the last seven years, unveiling what's going to happen to the church and everything. So in Hebrew, the word is uh, chason, C-H-A-Z-O-N, sorry, and the other word was C-H-O-K-M-A-H for wisdom. So chason, which is this word behind me, means vision. So what they would call the spirit of revelation would translate in Hebrew to the spirit of vision, because that is what revelation is. It's an unveiling. When the Lord gives you revelation about what to do, it's an unveiling or a vision of where are you going? What's going to happen? I got revelation on this. And again, this is something that gets abused throughout churches because they turned it into madness and, and their gift of prophecy is very real. In fact, the Bible specifically says in Revelation that the gift of prophecy is the spirit of the Lord and it will cease when the Lord returns. It hasn't ended. We're not writing books to the Bible like some of the cults do where they add on, right? And there's no adding on to it. But the Lord does speak through prophecy to reach people. The gift of prophecy is used to reach people who don't believe because when you speak into their life, either the, the word of God or you speak about something that's going to happen, the Lord reveals it. They're like, whoa, speaking in tongues is for the believer, but it's the least of the gifts. The problem is we, when you speak in tongues, there has to be an interpreter. Someone has to interpret. And so when you go to some places where they're all just blah, 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 and a non-believer comes in, you're like, what is this? And they get confused. There's an order to it. That's why Paul says that he rather speak five words that edify than a, tons of words in another language that no one would know. 
there has to be an interpreter. Because even if all of a sudden I started speaking in tongues and it was the most beautiful message about what the Lord has for this place and you and salvation and the anchor and, and where we're going and nobody interprets, what does it do for you for the night? Nothing. You're like, well, that sounded like gibberish up front. It was an actual message. Somebody here might go, well, I, I think that's Greek or I think that's French or I think that might be this language. But unless someone can translate it, it does nothing for you. All right. And so, again, vision. Where in the Greek, again, revelation, Hebrew vision is used. So the translation of the New Testament, Hebrew uses the same book as Revelation called the vision of John. If you ever read the translation of the New Testament, it would say the, the, the vision of John is what it says, where we would see Revelation in English. All right. Greek, it says apocalypse. Spanish too, apocalypse. So these are important because notice again what he's saying here. Okay. 17 again, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the father of glory may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of who him. That's how you understand because the Holy Spirit speaks to you. And as you said, someone giving you the gospel and telling you Jesus died on the cross to set you free, that he's the only way. That Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. And they quote scripture, you're showing this. The Holy Spirit begins to speak to you. And all of a sudden, your ears are open and your eyes are open. And you're like, wait a minute, this is the truth and I need it. So there is that spirit of wisdom and revelation where all of a sudden you're like, I want Jesus. And as you begin to grow in the word, it starts to make sense. And the coolest thing about this is the fact that you can have someone who goes to seminary or a Bible college and they study this in depth and the language and the Greek and everything. And then you can have someone who's been saved for one month, read it and the Holy spirit will tell them things. And then they'll come up and be like, last night I was reading and this and this was shown to me. And you're like, dude, that took me like a year in college to figure out. And then the Holy spirit showed you in a matter of a night because the Holy spirit will show you things. He's the one who teaches us, right? Remember the spirit of truth. And the world doesn't know him because the world, because he's not of the world. And we're not of the world if we're in Christ. We're going to talk about that later. So I want you all to turn to Isaiah chapter 1. We're going to look at verse 1. Isaiah chapter 1, verse 1. The vision of Isaiah, the son of Amos, which he saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem in the days of Uzziah, Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah, king of Judah. Just that verse. That's all I want to show you. And this is why, because that same word I'm talking about, a vision, is in Hebrew, this one. The vision of Isaiah. So if this is translated, translated to Greek, it would be the unveiling or the apocalypse of Isaiah, showing that Isaiah prophesied. you know how long Isaiah prophesied for? Anyone have an idea? Anyone want to take a guess? Close, 100 years. 100 years he prophesied for. He prophesied for multiple kings. He prophesied for 100 years. He prophesied about the crucifixion to the T. He prophesied about the millennial kingdom. He prophesied about the second coming of Christ. He prophesied about the first coming, about the virgin birth. In fact, there's 66 chapters. It takes you a while to get through them. And there's all these prophecies, the Antichrist, everything. He prophesied in details about everything, about what would happen with the Lord. It's a very good book. So I'm showing you this because, again, Hebrew shows the vision and prophecy go hand in hand. Vision and prophecy go hand in hand. Again, it's abused. It's abused. Uh, it's abused like this. Maybe you, Sean brought it to my attention Thursday. He showed it to me. I've seen it before with others. Maybe you've seen it. There's a big billboard that's been around San Diego to go see a guy that calls himself Prophet So-and-so, and he passes out his cards, and it says Prophet on it. When you meet somebody that has to hand you a business card that says Prophet, run away. There's a problem. Run away. If a person has the gift of prophecy, they're going to use it. It's going to come out. 
And if they're really, really prophesying because the Lord is moving on them, guess how accurate they're going to be? 100%. Not 99, not 90, not 80, not 50-50 flipping a coin. It's going to be 100% accurate. And there are people who have those gifts today. And again, it gets abused because you get places that say things like, we have the school of prophecy. You should come to it. Learn to be a prophet. But if the Lord didn't give you that gift, how are you supposed to learn to be a prophet? And what do you mean you have a school of prophecy? Well, they get it from the Old Testament in Samuel. They're, in fact, I'll say it like this, okay? And I may be, uh, well, I'll say it like this. There's a place up north. They call themselves Bethel. They have a school of prophecy. They teach everybody to do the same thing over and over. But if you read the scripture, the Bible literally says, no prophet will ever come out of Bethel. They didn't think that one through. <laughs> I'm not making fun of them. I want you to think about this. Because think about this. The Jehovah Witness did the same thing. They did this thing where they said that Jesus already returned. And he's here in San Diego. Did you know that? According to Jehovah Witnesses. It's a nice place. It's a good place to come. I don't think he came for the surf, though. So they say Jesus already turned to San Diego, but you can't go see him. Because he's in David's palace, which they built in San Diego, and he's in the inner room. And only if you are invited to the inner room, you can see him. What did Jesus say? Many will come in my name and will say, he's in the inner room. He's out in the desert. Don't believe them. It's funny. They missed that part. It's like, it's like blinders are on. They don't get it. So what happens when people abuse prophecy this is what it looks like. They do things like they know exactly what to say to you. And this is what those schools of prophecy do. They say things like this. I was praying for you, man. And I saw you as a tree with deep roots by a river growing as the river flew. Hey, bro, I was praying for you. And I saw you as a big tree. And they say the same thing over and over because there's nothing there. They, they, there's not a real gift happening. When it happens, it really happens. And, and sometimes it's heavy and sometimes it's to the point. It's a real gift that the Lord provides, right? It's abused. It's also abused like this. I'll give you another example. This actually really happened, okay? Have a young man on a mission field. It wasn't me, okay? My parents used to the mission field. It's not me. Okay, this isn't like I have a friend. I'm talking about myself, all right? It's a young man on the mission field. Really liked this young lady. He was interested in kind of getting to know her, date her, and, and see where it would go. He had serious interest in her. He was a nice guy. And she would attend another church. They were heavy into the prophecy stuff and in a way that was unhealthy. And so as he's trying to talk to her and see where this go and, and do you want to go on a couple dates, the pastor, whose buddy was 45, 46 years old, to mind you, this, at the time this young lady was 18, 19, says, the Lord is showing me right now that you have to marry my friend. No, the Lord never showed you that. He was hooking his buddy up. That's abuse. That's what that is. That's abuse. Yep, that's abuse. So the thing is, is if someone is going to use the gift of prophecy, revelation, it's going to be accurate 100% of the time. And unfortunately, you have the flip side of the coin. So if you've come out of the Pentecostal charismatic, I'm not picking on you. I'll show you the other side of this. The other side of this is groups that go, it doesn't ever happen. It's all done. It ended the book of Acts. Never will happen again. And the Holy Spirit doesn't move. And I'll just stare you down because I'm angry. And some of you already know who I'm talking about. All right. So the Holy Spirit kept moving past the book of Acts. The book of Acts was about the beginning of the church. All right. So the, the, to say that the prophecy ended is not true. This is what Daniel chapter nine tells us. It did not end, but there's nothing being added to this. But we pray for people and the Lord will reveal things. This is how, again, you read the book of Acts. It says they laid hands on the men that were waiting the tables, Stephen and all them. 
and the Lord said, set them aside. That happens still today. People still get healed today. The Holy Spirit still moves today. So for a church, I want you to show you the, the, the far spectrum. So to go on this far end over here and say that falling on the ground and doing the floppy fish is it right there. No, it's not. That's called a kundalini. That's a whole nother study I can show you and where it comes from. It's not of the Lord. And to go to this side in the extreme is saying, well, the Holy Spirit's done ever moving and, and he'll never move again. That's a lie too. Because there's been tons and tons of revivals that have happened. All right? So the Holy Spirit is always moving. I want everybody to turn to Revelation chapter 1. And we're going to start verses 1 and 2. The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show his servants things which must shortly take place. And he sent and signified it by his angel and his servant, John, who bore witness to the word of God and to the testimony of Jesus Christ to all things that he saw. All right. So that's Revelation 1 and 2. Now, go to Revelation 19. I don't kill people. Blow someone's speaker by accident. Revelation 19, verse 10. And I fell at his feet to worship him, but he said to me, See that you do not do that. I am your fellow servant and your brethren who have the testimony of Jesus. Worship God, for the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. Okay, so here's John. He's, oh, thank you. He is having the Lord's given vision of the end days, the last days. Um, it took me two and a half years to teach the revelation when we went through it. And so I want you to see this. He's having a vision of it. And at the end... He's so overwhelmed by everything he sees. He falls down to worship the angel. The angel's like, no, 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 no. Don't do that. The last angel that wanted worship, what happened to him? He got cast out, took a third with him, right? But notice what the angel says. The testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. The testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. So when you have individuals who are like, I can't stand prophecy. I hate prophecy. Prophecy doesn't exist anymore. That ended. The testimony of Jesus ended? You, can't, you don't like the testimony of Jesus? That's the greatest testimony ever. Without him dying on the cross for us to set us free, there is no testimony for you. There's no way for you to turn around and be like, this is how the Lord transformed my life. Without his death and resurrection, there's nothing. If Jesus never raised from the dead, then he's no different than Muhammad. He's no different than Buddha. He's no different than any other religious figure that came along because they all died. Only Jesus is the one who died and resurrected because he's fully man and he's fully God. The others are not. And so the testimony of this. So to look at biblical prophecy is to look at the testimony of Jesus. To study biblical prophecy is to study the testimony of Jesus, to love biblical prophecy is to love the testimony of Jesus. So the thing you have to realize is to twist, despise, and to hate biblical prophecy is to twist, despise, and hate the testimony of Jesus. Brings a whole new light, doesn't it? 100%. You either love Jesus or you will hate Jesus. There's no in-between. You can only serve one master. You cannot serve two masters. You will either serve Jesus Christ and love him or you'll serve Lucifer. That's what it comes down to. But I don't, I don't believe there's a devil. Okay, doesn't matter. Well, I'm an atheist. I'm the master of my own ship. That doesn't mean anything. <laughs> there's only two ways to go about this. Jesus or Lucifer. Are you telling me if I reject Jesus, I'm a Satan worshiper? No, I'm not saying that. What I'm saying is you will fall into the trap of Satan himself. You will end up serving him, even though you don't know you serve him. 
When we get to chapter two, I'm going to show you all about the spiritual warfare and how he twists you up and all the things that are in there. But again, going back to Ephesians. There's a reason why he's, this is all connected. Because look what he's saying. Again, that spirit of wisdom and revelation and the knowledge of him. The eyes of your understanding being enlightened that you'd understand that you may know what is the hope of his calling. The hope of his calling because without his calling, there is none of your calling. Remember, that was the first thing we talked about. What is your calling? Well, you don't know what your calling is unless you submit to the Lord and know his calling. Without him doing anything for us on the cross, there is no calling for you. Think about before you came to know Christ. Think about even if you grew up in church and you really didn't know Christ and you were just like, my parents go, my aunt goes, my grandma goes. You were trying to do religious things. Think about how lost you were. Think about if you were in drugs and alcohol or just trying to fulfill it with sex with different people how empty you were. You were always trying to find it and it never worked because without him fulfilling it, there's nothing for your life. And if you don't have a calling, you're going nowhere. And the ultimate calling he gives you is the answer. But without him doing it, you can't do it. And that's why this is all connected here because our eyes to understand it. And again, the hope of his calling, what are the riches of his glory and in his inheritance, the riches of his glory inheritance, what inheritance that he put everything under his feet is what it says. He conquered our enemies. Colossians says the same thing. He says he puts our enemies on display. That's what your whole testimony is about. So when you don't like to tell your testimony, you're still under the enemy. You tell your testimony, be like, this was the punk that hold me. And now look, he's all jacked up because Jesus messed him up for me. And he puts him under his feet. I'm set free. This is why, again, it's so important when you tell your testimony, you got to know your crowd. So when I tell my testimony to a group like this, I can go in depth on certain things and not hold back. But if they send me to a youth group, I got to do a PG version, depending on the kids. They might stay up all night. All right. So. Listen. When you're set free, your enemies are put on display by the Lord. That's your whole purpose of testimony. How Jesus set you free. If you feel you're not free, I don't know what to tell you. Again, look at this, what he says here, 19. <clears throat> and what is the exceedingly greatness of his power towards us who believe according to the workings of his mighty power. We believe his working power comes through us. We get dunamis power, dunamis power, okay? So I'm going to show you something about that, okay? Which is the third point. So the hope of his calling, Jesus' calling, all right, but we will be with him for all eternity and how we will be with him for all eternity. The inheritance for us through him, because his inheritance, we gain inheritance. All right. The inheritance of Jesus. Guess what it is? Anyone want to take a guess? It's you. It's you. You're the inheritance. I'm the inheritance. We get eternal life. That's our inheritance. But his inheritance is you because he paid the price for you and he gets you for all eternity. The only question you have to ask is, do you want it? He's a gentleman. He's not going to force it. So if you want to be his inheritance, he'll take you. If you don't, he'll let you have that choice. But you choose. He went and bought the whole thing. You know, when he died on the cross, he wore the crown of thorns, the curse of the earth. He bought everything back. This is why he's the lamb that stands up in Revelation and opens the deed. And he's the only one who can do it because you're the inheritance. I'm the inheritance. So the hope we have is in Jesus that we will be in his kingdom. So hope is to know how much God values you. And the question I have for you tonight is this. Do you know how much God valued you? You want to know? For God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believes in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. That's how much he values you. He gave his life so you can be free. 
He values you so much, he gave it all for you. All right? All of it. Think about that. You're his inheritance. You. You ever thought about that? You ever heard that before? It blew my mind when I heard it. I'm his inheritance? You're his inheritance? That's huge. Remember, power. Dunamis power. It's the Greek. D-U-N-A-M-I-S. Dunamis. It means controlled power. It's where we get the English word dynamic or dynamite. Controlled power. He gives us controlled power. Controlled power. His might. 20. Which he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places. Far above all principalities and powers and might and dominions. Every name that is named. Not only in this age, but also in which is to come. And he put all things under his feet and gave him to be the head over all things to the church. He's the head. Just like Peter says, shepherd, the sheep to the great shepherd shows up. That's what my job is. Jesus is the head of the church. I'm not the head of the church. I'm just the shepherd that he put in charge. He's the great shepherd, right? So dunamis power, controlled power by the Holy Spirit. Power to have victory over sin. Power to have victory over flesh. Power to have victory over Satan and his army. Do you understand that? Do you understand you have that power? You have the power to tell Satan to go away. You have the power to tell him he can't mess with you anymore if you're in Christ. You have the power to say no to sin. Not because you're like, oh, I want to do better. Oh, I'm going to do a New Year's resolution this year. Nope. It's that you can actually say no to drugs. You can say no to drunkenness. You can say no to pornography. Power that he gives us. Now. I want you to really grasp this. So my prayer as we go through Ephesians, that you will know how to walk in this power, in his power. I'm not going to have you raise your hand, but if you're here tonight or you're watching online, you're like, you don't get it. I just can't overcome it. You don't know his power then. Well, I just, it's addiction. You don't know his power. If you would have met me in 09, we'd have a different conversation because I didn't know his power. I was out of my gourd. I was not well. I was a mess. You wouldn't like me. You'd be like, that dude has got problems. And Joseph goes, he already still has problems. No, I'm kidding. So, no. I was not good. I was a mess. I was trapped in darkness. I was trapped in pornography. I was trapped in all kinds of garbage. And Jesus set me free. He set me free. Those things are broken because of the power of the Holy Spirit. Because I learned to walk in that power. And I've learned to overcome. And then I've learned to tell the enemy, go away. Even when he's yipping like a dog, go away. Walk in that power. To have the Lord, ask the Lord to give you that power so you take back what the enemy has stolen. Now, as we understand that, okay, he mentions some of the rankings of the fallen in this in the very end. But I want, to, I want to save to go in depth in that study when we get to Ephesians 6, because it lists in Ephesians 6 the depth of it. And I want, to, I want to break that down. But the reason is, is that you can know the enemy. The problem is people get so fascinated with the enemy, they live in his camp. You should know your enemy and how to fight your enemy. That's why you need to know. That's why there's specifics of principalities and powers and mights and dominions. Ephesians 6 is going to have more of that. Like I said, we'll look at that in depth then. But again, know your enemy. And know that you have the Lord and his power to overcome the enemy. You have his armor and his weapons. Jesus died on a cross and he rose from the dead. Jesus destroyed the power of Satan and his kingdom. Do you know that? It's already done. His kingdom and is already done Finito. Finished. 
To talus die, as he said on the cross, paid in full. It's wiped out. All you have to do is submit yourself to Jesus, ask for him to come into your life and set you free. And the Holy Spirit moves in you in power and transforms you. And this is how people have miracles of overcoming cocaine overnight. Overcoming things overnight. But I've been battling things. I've been battling the way I speak. I've been battling cravings. Power. Say no to them. Fight back in prayer. Not by your power. By the Lord. And when you're like, Lord, I can't do it anymore. I remember I, I, I struggled in this. I'm honest about it. I don't know why people aren't honest about this, to be honest with you. It's kind of a weird statement, isn't it? <laughs> I tell you, I, got, I, I had a porn problem. I'm looking at it going, I like it too much, Lord. You got to do something. And I can feel the Lord pull it away. I literally felt like a hand pulled off of me. And then I heard this really clear in my mind from the Lord. They're going to hell. What do you want to do about it? They're going to hell. What do you want to do about it? I can never see it the same again. They're going to hell. What do you want to do about it? And I can never see it the same ever again. And I saw broken people, abused people. And then I started to research some of the stories, the testimonies of people who've come out of that industry. Because there's a whole ministry. It's called Pink Cross. And it's a whole ministry to get people out. It's a billion dollar industry. It makes more money than the NFL, the NHL, Major League Baseball, all the sports combined. It is a billion dollar industry. It comes out of right here, out of California. An hour north of here. And it's on a global scale. And they're all going to hell. So what do you want to do about it? So people started to reach out. These were people coming out of this industry. And the stories were insane. Insane. I, I, I can't even tell you some of the stories because of the kids in the room. Horrendous stories. What was happening to them. And some of the stories I can tell you were ones like they went to a church and they just wanted to go in there because they needed hope. But everything they'd done, the enemy bombarded them. So they walked away before they could get in until someone came to them. One of them, she had shared, because she had heard the gospel and she was in this industry and she got a job and they were flying her to a spot. And she grabbed the Bible and she didn't know where to read and she opened it up. And she turns to Revelation and it says, I hold one thing against you. You have this Jezebel and I will throw you into a sick bed. And she said she landed. She bought a ticket. She went home and she gave it all up for Jesus. So there's another guy. He's actually, this is, this one kind of upset me because he's a pastor that was pastoring a church and he didn't do anything wrong. And this young lady comes in and she comes out of the industry and she's the Lord's healing her. And she's getting mentored by young ladies to the women's ministry and being mentored and learning to let go and to heal from all this. She's been through so much abuse, so much stuff. And one day the Lord goes, I'm going to give you something special. And as the Lord began to work in her life, the Lord moved on that pastor's life and he felt for her like, I want to marry her. I want to love her that she knows what it means to have a husband. And people mocked him and made fun of him. They're still married and they're still rolling strong and the ministry's going really good. But the part that really, really upset me about the whole thing, it wasn't what the pastor did. It's what people in his congregation did. When they found out who she was, they went and watched her videos. And some of them were deacons and elders. And I sit there and going, so here's a woman who comes out of the industry who's healed by Jesus, that the Lord gave her a new beginning, that the Lord gave her something special. And you're going to be a nasty punk. I'm sorry. And call yourself an elder and then go watch your stuff because you're curious. I'd fire you in a heartbeat. It's a mess. Where's the grace? Where's the mercy? 
right? Out of craziness. We've all come out of darkness. All of us come out of darkness. Some of worse. You have a new beginning in Christ through that power. The past is done. You need to understand that. Jesus rose from the dead to set you free. He destroyed the power of Satan and his kingdom. Do you understand that? You truly understand that his kingdom's done. But it's getting worse out here. Yeah, it is. The Antichrist is coming. If he's not here already, which I believe he's already here. It's going to get worse. But the blessed hope is he's going to pull his church. That we go home. We are going to go home. Maranatha, that is right. The kingdom of Satan is done. It's defeated. So Jesus bought the deed of the earth. Everything that Adam and Eve lost, Jesus bought back with his blood. He bought it all back. Jesus is the head of the church. I'm not the head of the church. You're not the head of the church. And any place you go to where the pastor is like, I'm the top of the top. You need to be like, see ya. Guess what I am? The top servant in this place. That's it. Take that whole paradigm the world says this is leadership. And flip it. And I'm just, that's all I am. And if you want to be a pastor, you're called to be a servant. You want to be a minister, you're called to be a servant. That's what it comes down to. Jesus paid it all. He paid a beautiful price for us. He gave his life to set us free so we could walk in power. So, what a beautiful way to go right into communion, understanding what he did. So I want you to close your Bibles. So Jesus, we talked about him overcoming the enemy, and he's with his disciples. He's about to go into this. He's doing Passover with them, breaking the bread. He's, he's having the Passover with them. He's going to pay the ultimate price, and he's going to go to the cross. He's going to buy it all back. He's going to crush all of Satan's plans. He's going to crush everything because he's king of kings and lord of lords, and there's no one else but him. And the beauty is, is he takes this, and he has the bread, and he breaks it, and he says, this is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And then taking the cup, he gave it to his disciples, which was the cup of redemption in the Passover, and he took the cup of wrath and said, this is my blood, which is spilled for the remission of sin. Do this in remembrance of me. So here's what we're going to do. I'm going to pray for all of you that you would receive that power and that you would know how to walk in it and be set free. Lord God, I pray right now, Lord, I pray for this group. I pray for those online watching, Lord, anyone listening later from the recording. Lord, I pray right now in the name of Jesus, Holy Spirit, you would move upon them. You would move upon the people Lord, I pray right now in the name of Jesus, you would heal all the infirmities, Lord God. Heal the cancer, heal anything that's going on. Lord, I pray that you would heal any mental illness. Lord, I pray you would heal just the aches, the pains in the name of Jesus. Lord, I pray right now that you would break every addiction. Lord God, that you would move upon them and you would break the addictions of drugs and alcohol and pornography that they would know how to walk in this power, Lord God. I pray for those right now in the name of Jesus that are struggling to listen to you, that they would hear you clearly, that their ears would be open to hear you and their eyes would be open to see you. I pray for the families here to be healed, for the marriages to be healed. Lord God, I pray right now in the name of Jesus, Lord God, that you would begin to move upon each person here, that they would proclaim the gospel that they would share what you've done on the cross. And Lord God, that no one would be ashamed of the gospel, Lord. Lord Lord God, I pray that you would heal everyone. And I pray for those who have broken spirits, Lord God. They've been so beat up by the enemy, Lord God, I pray that you would set them free, that what the enemy has bound them in chains, that those chains would break in the name of Jesus, that those wounds would heal in the name of Jesus, and that they would be a new creation in you, Lord God. And I pray for this place, Lord God. You would keep your hand upon it, that it would be a light to the surrounding area. And as we move forward, Lord God, that you would continue to work in this place, that no principality or power would come against it, Lord God, that you would guard us, Lord. And Lord God, that you would keep your hand upon us. 
And I pray for those who have doubt, Lord God, that you would heal their doubt, just like Thomas, that you would heal them in that. And those who are struggling with unbelief, that you would heal their unbelief. I pray for those who have come out of the occult or have been tormented by demons, that every chain would break, that we rebuke those in the name of Jesus, that you would set them free. Lord God, that the demonic spirits that speak to them would cease in the name of Jesus. If it's okay with you, I'd like to pray for some people specifically that the Lord's put in my heart. Is that okay with you guys? Yeah? Okay. Lord God, I pray for Tanya. Lord God, I pray that, Lord, you would heal her in the name of Jesus, that you would set her free, that you would heal her mind and protect her kids. I pray that you would keep your hand upon her kids. And, Lord God, that she would know that you love her and that you have a plan for her. And everything she's looking for is in you, Lord. I pray, Lord God, that she would trust you and obey you, Lord. Lord God, I pray for Karen, Lord God, that you would empower her. Holy Spirit, that you would move upon her to empower her. That she would hear you clearly, Lord. And that she would lean into you and trust you, Lord. And that she would know what you're trying to do in her life, Lord God. And how you're moving in her life. And Lord, I pray that you would give her the words to speak to those that are heavy upon her heart. And that those words will never come back void because your word never comes back void, Lord. So I pray that you would show her what to do, Lord, and how to say these things. Lord God, I just pray for all the, the men who are helping me these, that are in this group, the Joshua's, Lord God, that you would embolden them. You would prepare them for what's coming. You would give them clarity. And Lord God, that they would just trust you fully. That you would begin to work through them in a mighty way, Lord. Lord, we thank you. We thank you for all that you're doing in this place. We pray for peace and comfort for those who have lost loved ones. And Lord, just continue to work in this place. Holy Spirit, continue to move upon these people. And Lord God, I don't know this guy's name. It's in front of me in the blue, but I pray that you would set him free. I pray that you would heal him. I pray that you would give his mind peace and that he would know what true peace is in you, Lord Jesus. So Lord, I lift these all up to you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen.